um, but we are going to emphasize the negative outcomes. <laughs> the, um, lost the varieties. Um, Philippines lost about 7,000 varieties. 10 years. Um, I think, I forget where it is, 20,000, 40,000 varieties in, in uh, Greater Asia is lost. When I say lost, a lot of these still exist in seed banks. You know, they're frozen in seed banks. Um, but they're sort of degenerating there. And it's very expensive. And now there's a project to build a seed bank in the North Pole so that you don't have to pay the high energy costs. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> Too late. Should have done it before global warming. Um, so you get this uniformity, which obviously is, is highly vulnerable, right? In terms of disease and, and climatic um, oscillations and whatnot. And, but then, I guess, you remember the thing I talked about before, how agriculture colonizing the, the food system and colonizing the farm and whatnot. What happens is the farmer loses control over each stage in the production chain, right? Loses control over fertilization, loses control over the reproduction of seed, or so it loses control over genetic um, resilience, lose, and then has to buy these things, right? Um, and we've seen this. Production goes up, but in fact, the number of hungry increased because of poor distribution. It's really only two reasons why people are hungry. <laughs> One, you don't let them produce their own food. Or two, they don't have enough money to buy it. I guess there's a third, buy lousy food. Um, I've said this. This um, poster comes from India. And in India, you have, did you guys read the farmer suicide article? You should read it if you didn't do it. it, was, it I think it was required. Um, it, it wasn't required? I thought it was. Anyway, um, in the Punjab, which is the home of the Green Revolution um, in India, uh, you know, they went in and, and they worked with farmers who were already good farmers, right? They didn't work with poor, they, the Green Revolution did not start with poor farmers at all. It didn't start with farmers who were just hanging on by their fingernails and, oh my goodness, look at this seed, look at this fertilizer, and now we can eat and develop. Um, they went in and worked with the kulaks, you know, the people with 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 um, hectares, uh, private farmers. And um, people who knew, who had, who could put up land as to get credit, right? So you put up your land, take out the credit, buy the inputs, grow the crop, sell, pay off the credit. But if you didn't have the land, no one was going to give you credit. Because if you lost the crop, they took the land. That's actually what happened to my family. We used to grow coffee in Puerto Rico. Well, the um, Bank of America came in and um, we, lo we borrowed money and, and got hit by a hurricane, couldn't pay it back. And so we lost the farm and moved to New York. And that's why I'm here. Um, so this is my revenge. <laughs> the, uh, that was the first Green Revolution. There was a second Green Revolution in which um, farmers without land were given credit and the state backed up the loans. Um, and it was because there was plenty of money to go around, so you might as well do that. And, um, and that really spread it out to the smaller farmers, um, who were then some of the first to go under. With the larger farmers, we had that process of differentiation happen. So that, basically, I'm, I'm a product of differentiation, right? So where did my, farm, my family's farm go after we lost it? Where do you think it went? I mean, obviously the bank took it, but then who did they sell it to? not smaller farmers, right? They sold to someone who could pay. So the concentration of the ownership of coffee farms in Puerto Rico went up, right? 
and then smaller farmers like us dropped out. 